to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ to the young evangelist titus paul said for this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. Titus chapter 1, verse number 5. Welcome to our study of the books of Titus and Philemon. We're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today, and we want to make sure that you visit our website as well thegospelofchrist.com. We have a host of free Bible resources there, CDs, DVDs, audios that you can download and listen to. On top of that, we'd also like to encourage you if you have a Bible question or you'd like to study the Bible further, please contact us either by email or phone or you can write to us at the information at the end of this broadcast. We'd love to hear from you and as always, Today's lesson is being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. We encourage you to visit the Church of Christ in your area where you'll always find a friendly welcome and people who love the Word of God. Paul is writing to the young evangelist Titus to give him some very stern and difficult orders for the church on the island of Crete. For this reason I left you in Crete. What is it, Paul? That you would set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city. You know, when you think of Titus' job, what a challenge this must have been for him. What all was lacking? We don't know all the details, but from the book itself, we can determine some of those things. Setting in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders when a congregation is missing elders, there is indeed something lacking there. And so those two may go hand in hand and serve as the bulk of what Paul wanted Titus to do. Every congregation of the Lord's people needs qualified leaders. Leaders who are concerned about souls, who will shepherd the flock of God, 1 Peter 5, who are ready to give an account on the day of judgment for souls they've watched over, Hebrews 13, 17, who will be there to help and encourage in time of need. Now, we discussed in our lesson on 1 Timothy chapter 3 through 6, our second lesson on the book of 1 Timothy about the qualifications of elders from both 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. And so we won't rehash or go back over a lot of that information. You can see those lessons as well to learn more about what we said there concerning what God says there about the qualifications of elders. And thus we want to hit more of the, the practical messages, more of the living messages that we find in the book of Titus. Titus. What do we know about God Himself from the book of Titus? Here's an encouraging point. Titus 1 verse 2 says, Christians are living in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before time began. When I think about what makes Christianity so great, what makes us get up when life knocks us down, when difficulties come our way, I'm living, you're living in hope of eternal life. That's not, well, maybe, or my best guess, or let's hope we make it there in the sense we use it. Like we might say, I hope it rains tomorrow. That's not what it is. Hope does not disappoint. Romans 5, verses 1 through 5. Hope is assured anticipation. I'm living in hope of eternal life, and here's the surety of it. Hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie, promised before time began. You know, the Bible says it's impossible for God to lie. Hebrews 6 verse 18, God, God says, I am God, I change not. Malachi 3 verse 6, Jesus, who is also divine, says, the Bible says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
Hebrews 13, 8. And so what do I know about the Godhead? God is a constant. God is something you can always be sure of, His nature, His person, His words, and that's the guarantee of the hope of eternal life. As sure as God is, His truth is, His nature is, is just as sure as the hope of eternal life. And so what's the encouragement? Friend, don't stop living the Christian life. Don't give up. Don't let life knock you down. Don't let sin take hold of you. Why? You're living in hope of eternal life. If then you're raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 1. Now, although Paul deals with, in 1 Timothy 3, about in verses 5 through 11, maybe even verses 12 and 13, some of the ideas relative to the work of elders, he says something very significant about false teachers and how their message must be stopped. Look in Titus chapter 1, verse number 11. The Scripture says, Of these false teachers whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. What do I know about false teachers? Their message will spread like wildfire, like cancer. You've got to put a stop to it before it gets started. They can subvert whole families, the text says. What's that mean? They can trick a whole family. They can persuade a whole family into believing a lie if we're not careful. And so as part of the work of an elder, part of the work of a gospel preacher, and part of the concern and work of every Christian ought to be the stop the mouth of false teachers. How do you do that? By standing up with the truth and saying with our mouth, what God has said. We must contend earnestly for the faith. We must buy the truth and sell it not. Jude 3 and Proverbs 23, 23. We need to oppose error with truth in love. Ephesians 4 verse 15. And we need to preach the word. 2 Timothy 4 verse 2. Speak as the oracles of God. 1 Peter 4 verse 11. As Jesus opposed the religious leaders of His day by showing them from the Old Testament Scriptures the error of their way, so today false teachers must be stopped. And the way to stop them is with truth. Truth is powerful. Romans 1.16 the Word of God is living and powerful. Hebrews 4 verse 12, and it has the ability to shine forth, to show error, and to help people see the way of our God. One of the practical lessons that Titus points out is found in Titus chapter 1 verse 16, and what a powerful lesson this is. Did you know you can tell if a person's faithful? by their works or their actions. Notice Titus chapter 1, verse number 16. The Scripture says, They profess to know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Here are people who say, yeah, we know God. We're Christians. We're members of the Lord's body. We're servants of Christ. And you hear all that. And then you look at their life. By their works, they deny Him. Unprofitable, abominable, ungodly, living impure and immoral lives. You can tell by someone's actions whether they are a faithful child of God or not. If someone's faithful, does that mean they're never going to make a mistake? It's not what we're saying. We do sin, but if we sin, we're ready to make it right. 1 John 1, verse 7 through 10. However, the person who claims to be a child of God, but it's only putting up a facade, putting on a show. You can look at that person's life and see. Look at their speech. Do they talk like a Christian? Look at where their priorities are. Is God at the top? Look at how they relate to things of this world. Do they love the world? Are they involved in abominable, ungodly, immoral things? If so, then friend, I know their life doesn't back up their speech. And for me to be faithful to God, I must live true to Him every day. Again, we're not saying someone's going to be perfect all the time. That's not the idea. But are we trying to walk in the light? 1 John 1 verse 7, when we find sin in our life, are we ready to repent and pray 
that it be forgiven. Acts 8 verse 20 through 22, and are we struggling in that battle, fighting the good fight of faith each and every day as a Christian ought to. Now, one of the responsibilities that Paul gives to Titus is to make sure he teaches proper or sound teaching for the church in Crete. Look at Titus chapter 2, verse number 1. The Scripture says, Paul speaking, But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Paul says, yes, there are people teaching error. Yes, you can look at their life and see that. But Titus, here's what you need to focus on as a gospel preacher in the Lord's church. Speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. The word sound in its literal Greek meanings means well or healthy. Teach things that will help people to grow. 2 Peter 3 verse 18. Teach things that will build people up in the faith. Acts 20 verse 32. How, how do we teach what's proper? Very simply, by teaching this book. Friend, how can you go wrong if you say and teach what this book says. If a man studies the book, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, if he searches the Scriptures daily, Acts 17 verse 11, if he prepares his heart to seek the law of the Lord to do it and to teach its statutes and judgments, Ezra 7 verse 10, and if we have the mindset that God's will must come before our own, then we can teach and preach what's right. Speak as the oracles of God. 1 Peter 4.11 Preach the Word. 2 Timothy 4 verse 2 Be ready always to give an answer for the reason of the hope that is within you with meekness and fear. 1 Peter 3 verse 15 If someone asks me a Bible question and I, instead of saying, I think or I believe or I feel, I say, let's get out the Bible and see. Friend, you just can't go wrong with teaching and preaching like that. But all these feel good, all what's popular, what society wants, what others may want to hear, that's not going to help anybody find sound or healthy doctrine. Now in the book of Titus, Paul mentions some various commands given to people of all ages. And although it's a rather lengthy text, I want you to look at Titus chapter 2 Verses 2 through 10 with me. The scripture says, The older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. The older women likewise, that they may be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the younger women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the Word of God may not be blasphemed. Likewise, exhort the younger men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself a pattern of good works and doctrine, integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity or faithfulness that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Here you've got five different classes. You've got older men. How are they to be? They're to be looked up to as, as reverent, as honorable, as wise in their behavior, in their actions, in their speech. What about the older women? Examples to the younger women. Those who are trying to live a godly life. Those who are focused on spiritual matters. The younger women, they're to look up to them. They're taught to be keepers of the home, to love their husbands, to be discreet, to be chaste, to be obedient to their own husbands. The younger men, integrity, incorruptibility, their doctrine, their lifestyle, having speech that cannot be condemned, that even the opponent, when standing up for truth, they speak the way they ought to speak. And what about bond servants or the employer-employee relationship? They're to be faithful, not to be lazy, 
to do the will of God as God would have them to do. And so every class has a responsibility to God and to others. And in view of every class of those people, Paul now turns our attention to the grace of God that ought to motivate all of us to faithful living for Christ. Look at Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. The Scripture says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Look at the wonderful words here. The grace of God, watch what it does, that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Do you remember Ephesians 2 verse 8? By grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself, it's the gift of God. Do you remember John 1, 17? The law came through Moses, but grace and truth are in Christ. Grace is in Christ. Jesus is the epitome of God's grace. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that we through His poverty might be made rich. The grace of God, and watch what it does, that brings salvation. Who did that appear to? To the elect? to just a few, to a certain group? No, has appeared to all men. God says in Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. God wants all men to be saved. 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. God is not slow concerning His promises, as some men count slowness, but is long-suffering toward us, watch this now, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so that marvelous grace of God, it brings salvation. It's appeared to all men. But did you know that grace is a teacher or an instructor? Teaching us, in view of what God's grace brought, in view of what Jesus did, the grace of God teaches us, denying ungodliness, worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. What does grace teach me to do? Grace is not a license to sin. Paul said in Romans 6 verse 1, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Grace was given to deal with the sin problem. Does that mean we can keep sinning more and more and getting more? No, certainly not. God forbid. Romans 6 verses 1 and 2. How shall you who died to sin live any longer in it? Grace teaches us to deny ungodliness, to deny worldly lust, and to live soberly, righteously, and godly. Grace teaches me to deny myself, to deny what I want, to realize that life's not about me, to say no to the flesh, to say no to Satan, to say no to temptation in view of the grace of God. Why would you ever want to give in to sin? And then it teaches me how to live. Not only do I deny, I live soberly. I'm living in view of the reality and the seriousness of eternal life. Righteously. I want to be like God and soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. And so look at what grace does for the child of God. You know, Christians often sing the song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Twas grace. When I think about God's grace, look at the wonder and the beauty of the amazing grace of God. And then in Titus chapter 2, verse number 14, we learn that through obedience to God and by His grace, we become a unique, a special, or a peculiar people. Notice Titus chapter 2, verse number 14. The Bible says of God our Savior Jesus Christ who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify, himself, purify for Himself His own special people, zealous for good works. You know, when I think about Christians, I think about their relationship to God and the world, we're a special people. What's that mean? God has chosen 
the church has chosen a plan of salvation, has chosen a class of people, Christians, anybody can get in that class. But that class is chosen, special, unique. We're to proclaim the praises of Him who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 9. Then in Titus chapter 3, as we think about Paul's continuing encouragement to Titus to set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city. Paul will now tell Titus that just like God created Christians for good works, we as God's people must also have those works in our life. Notice Titus chapter 3 verses 12 through 15. The Bible says, When I send Artemis to you or Tychicus, being diligent to come to me at Nicopolis, goes on to say, I decided to spend the winter there. He mentions Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their journey with haste that they may lack nothing. And then notice, and let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. When we think about the Christian life and what it really means to follow God, it's about maintaining good works. It's about keeping an even keel, level, trying to do right, to meet urgent needs. It means to help others, to, to try to do good in our community, and to be zealous for what God has called us to do in this life. In the remainder of our time, let's now focus on the one chapter book of Philemon. Philemon is all about mending broken relationships. A problem had occurred between some Christians. This problem had a background which would have caused difficulty in that day and age. Let me mention some of the main characters in the book of Philemon. There is Onesimus. Onesimus is a slave, or what we might think of today as a servant. He sold himself to work for the home and the family of Philemon. We're going to learn that he runs away to Rome, comes in contact with Paul, obeys the gospel, and now he's a beloved brother, a faithful and beloved brother, as well as a servant. He was a convert of the Apostle Paul while in Rome, verse 11 teaches us, but there was still something that needed to be fixed. Onesimus had stolen from Philemon. Verse 18 tells us that he needed to return, he needed to make it right for stealing that time and labor that he owed to his master Philemon. And then of course there is Philemon. Philemon was also a convert of the Apostle Paul. Verse number 18 teaches us, actually the church meets in the house of Philemon according to verse number 2, very likely because of his ability to own servant and have the church in his home. He would be a wealthy Christian, has a wife and a son that are also mentioned here, but Philemon has been wronged by what is now a brother in Christ, Onesimus. Paul then teaches us about the path to reconciliation in mending broken relationships through the book of Philemon. For example, the path to reconciliation requires that we see the good before the bad. Look at Philemon verses 4 through 7. Paul says in beginning in verse number 4, To Philemon, I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother." You know, when we think about how is it going to, how are these relationships going to be mended? When people have a fight, when they have a disagreement, how are you going to find a common ground? You've got to be thankful for them. Paul is thankful for Philemon. He is most definitely thankful for Onesimus. He's obeyed the gospel. He's turned his life around. He's actually aiding Paul there as well. And so Paul's thankful for both parties. And both parties need to be thankful for each other. And everything give thanks. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18. The Bible teaches in 1 Chronicles 23 verse 20 that we're to honor God with a spirit of thanksgiving. And so we need to sometimes see past the problem and see their eternal souls involved in these problems that desperately need to be mended.
need to be corrected. And then, of course, you need to pray for them. We need to, according to verse number 4, Paul says, I've been praying for you, and no doubt that encouraged Philemon, and it encouraged Onesimus. For the effect of fervent prayer of a righteous man, it overcomes much. Paul then recognizes and acknowledges their love and faith in Christ Jesus. Look at their good works. Look at the good things that they can do for God and for His kingdom. He recognized that their reputation and, and he makes his appeal to reconciliation based on the appeal of Christianity. Paul will go on to say in the book, Yes, Onesimus has wronged you. Yes, he ran away. He's defrauded you. But perhaps this occurred. Look at the providence of God. Perhaps this occurred so that he could learn the truth. Come back to you no longer as just a slave or a worker, but as a brother in Christ. Paul puts God into the middle of this situation of reconciliation. Friend, for matters to be resolved, and for Christians to mend broken relationships, we've got to see the good in each other. We need to be praying for it and working toward it, and you've got to put God in the center. You've got to realize there's something greater than me. There's something higher than my emotions. There's something greater than me being defrauded. God and Christians working together to be an example and to be a light that is what is so powerful in this context. And so we think about both Titus and Philemon. They encourage us to live faithfully to the Lord every day in view of the grace of God and in view of the power of the gospel. Friend, we ask you today, have you obeyed the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Are you a Christian? If not, why not become one today? Have you heard the Word of God? Romans 10 verse 17. Do you believe Jesus is God's Son? John 8, verse 24. Would you be willing to repent of sin? Luke 13, verse 3. Make the great confession Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Romans 10, verse 10. And would you be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Acts 2, verse number 38. If you've never done that, we encourage you to as we each strive to live faithfully in view of the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.